Uh, we're moving now to a panel with a wonderful name, uh, to a vision taking shape. Uh, and in that sense, we're moving into some of the links between the visions and the ideals and the practical. I'm Catherine Marshall. I'm at the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, uh, which means that I grapple and I've had many conversations with Mary Evelyn, particularly over the years, on trying to reconcile and build positive links between the ecology and the environment, but also social justice and the fight for peace. Uh, we have a panel with an extraordinary variety of intellectual firepower, uh, but also experience uh, a lot of uh, exposure to different regions of the world uh, and to different religious traditions. Uh, and to the uh, interreligious approaches. So we will just go one by one. I'll do a very brief uh, introduction of all three to start with, and then uh, have my primary role as timekeeper. Uh, so the first person who will speak is Louis uh, Leo uh, Lefebure, uh, who is a professor at Georgetown University, the Matteo. Rizzi Professor of Theology. He has extensive experience working across the world, around the world, particularly in Asia, uh, and has worked, among other things, with several of us on the uh, Parliament of the World's Religions over many years. Uh, Reverend Nancy Wright is a pastor at the Ascension Lutheran uh, Church uh, in South Burlington, Vermont. Uh, and she is also uh, dealing with environmental ministry uh, within the, uh, within the uh, synod. Uh, and finally, last but not least, um, Heather Eaton is a professor at St. Paul University in Ottawa, Canada. And the list of her topics of interest is very long. Uh, it includes um, peace studies, gender, ecology, uh, religion, uh, and um, uh, other studies. So without further ado, I'll turn to Leo. Stop and see. The call is so simple, but can be life transforming. Especially in times like the tumultuous present, stop and see is one of the most important messages we can hear. Thomas Berry devoted the latter part of his illustrious career to calling people to stop destroying our common home, the earth, and see the implications of what they were doing, and learn to see the earth and all forms of life in a new way. Barry rooted his contemporary call in ancient wisdom, including especially the wisdom of China. One important expression of this call comes from the great 6th century Tian Tai master, Zhi Yi lived from 538 to 597, who left us a classic set of lectures on meditation known as the Moho Chi Quan, which has been variously translated as great stopping and seeing or great calming and contemplation. Stopping and seeing have been called the yin and yang of Buddhist meditation, complementary twin halves of a unified whole. Stop the delusion. Open our eyes in full awareness and see what is right before us as if for the first time and act in compassion and freedom. GE tells us, just as someone with clear vision can avoid a dangerous road, there are intelligent people in the world who can avoid what is bad. If beginning practitioners can see the meaning of this, they can be a reliance for the world. For those who persevere in the practice, GE promises stopping and seeing is enlightenment. Enlightenment is stopping and seeing. When we stop the delusion that leads to ceaseless craving and hatred, we can learn to see reality as it is and avoid danger. He says, it is like when you light a lamp in a dark room, the darkness cannot claim rights over the room and cannot refuse to go just because it has been there for a long time. As soon as the lamp is lit, the darkness vanishes. Many traditions flowed into the lectures of GE, and this is a little bit like Thomas Berry. His father was a Confucian scholar, 
and his mother's family had long been deeply involved in Taoism. When he was young, the recitation of a Buddhist scripture moved him so profoundly that he hoped to enter Buddhist monastic life. However, his parents objected, and so he waited until after their deaths before entering a Buddhist monastery. There he became one of the most influential leaders in the history of Buddhism in China. He came to represent different things to different people. Again, to me, it reminds me a bit of Thomas Berry. To the followers of the Tiantai path of Buddhism, he is their esteemed founder and systematizer. To the Chan or Zen tradition, he is a Chan or Zen master, while Pure Land Buddhists honor him as their mentor. From the confluence of the great Chinese wisdom traditions of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism, the voice of GE resounds to the present, calling us to stop and see. And this is where the particular importance and urgency at this point in history, when we are at that danger zone, kind of like that relatively calm part of the river before we go over the waterfall, <laughs> as we're approaching ever greater levels of ecological catastrophe. Yet we seem powerless to change course in time to avert tremendous suffering. From many points on our planet, we hear the cries of suffering. As ice in the polar regions melts at increasing rates of speed, the Sahel Desert in Africa expands further southward, absorbing farmland and threatening traditional way of life of many people. Children and adults in many areas around the world suffer serious harm from drinking tainted water, from breathing polluted air, from living near hazardous waste. Every week brings new reports of catastrophic threats to ecological well-being of our planet. Many predictions ominously envision massive displacement and widespread suffering on an unprecedented scale that the human community at present is simply not prepared to address. It's not necessary to project contemporary ecological concerns back into GE to see that the call to stop and see has relevance for our present situation. A few years ago, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm met with the Chinese scholar Pan Yue to talk about the creation of an ecological culture uniting China and the global community. Pan Yue interprets the Confucian tradition as a resource for shaping a religiously inspired ecological culture. But he told his visitors, we have environmental laws on the books, but we can't enforce them because we don't have an ecological culture. The American visitors, Mary Evelyn and John, responded, this is true in the United States as well. At times, we have had to sue our own environmental protection agency to enforce standards for clean water and air. This is because we have a weak ecological culture and strong lobbyists for the coal, oil, and gas industries. Pan Yue interprets the Confucian tradition as a resource for shaping a religiously inspired ecological culture. In a similar manner, Mary Evelyn and John continue the project of Thomas Berry, who came to China to study in 1949 and later moved through interreligious understanding to proclaiming himself a geologian. In his own way, Thomas Berry challenged all of us to stop and see. Pope Francis has taken up this challenge in his encyclical Laudato Si and also called humans to stop and see. Stop the devastation of the earth, see what we are doing, think differently, and work together in caring for our common home. And Pope Francis warns that the usual manner of seeing promoted by the technological paradigm can appear to be inexorable in today's world. As he tells us, technology tends to absorb everything into its ironclad logic. The technocratic paradigm, he tells us, tends to dominate economic and political life. The economy accepts every advance in technology with a view to profit without concern for its potentially negative impact on human beings. Finance overwhelms the real economy. And he notes that some people believe economics and technology will solve environmental problems, but Francis cautions us about our failure to see, 
He suggests that the market by itself cannot guarantee integral human development and social inclusion. We fail to see the deepest roots of our present failures, which have to do with the direction, goals, meaning, and social implications of technological and economic growth. To oppose this reign of technocratic logic, Francis, like Thomas Berry, calls for an integral ecological culture to be informed by religious and ethical principles that go beyond the domain of empirical science and that draw from many different religious sources. In this context, Pope Francis, again like Thomas Berry, stressed the importance of interreligious dialogue and cooperation. In addressing a truly global dilemma, no one religious tradition in isolation can solve the crisis. And Pope Francis hopes that a convergence of voices and values from di different traditions can contribute to the ecological conversion that is so desperately needed. Since China is such an important part of the world community, this appeal has special relevance for our consideration in relation to Chinese uh, traditions. China and the United States are among the key actors in either protecting or harming the community of life on Earth. Both have contributed to the present situation, and both societies are called upon to be creative in caring for the Earth. Now, in plumbing the wisdom of China in relation to this crisis, there are dangers. Some have been critical of any naive notion that Asian wisdom can somehow solve all the problems of modern Western culture. Russell Kirkland criticized the project of finding ready-made ecological solutions in ancient Taoist texts. Jordan Paper warns about the danger of Western scholars finding solutions in ancient Chinese texts, claiming that some of these texts have little, if any, relationship um, to these issues. So it's not a question of naively projecting our concerns into the distant past or seeking some kind of wisdom from the East as a magic answer for all Western problems. What we need is a serious interreligious conversation that brings our contemporary awareness to a fresh reading of the religious traditions that have long shaped our world. Many different religious traditions have resources that can be studied anew in shaping an integral ecological culture. And so I would like to honor Thomas Berry by reflecting on the challenge of stopping and seeing in a dialogue between the call of Pope Francis and the wisdom of the Chinese traditions of Buddhism, Confucianism, and Taoism. Buddhists warn us that when our vision is dominated by craving, we fail to see the natural world as it is and cause much unnecessary suffering. It talks of the three poisons. Ignorance or delusion leads to craving. Craving invites frustration, leads to anger. The cycle goes on without beginning or end. And you can analyze a lot of our world in terms of this. We don't know who we are or how to see our world. We crave things to make us happy and secure. That doesn't work out, so we get angry, which increases our ignorance, and the cycle gets ever more ominous. Buddhists critique anthropocentrism, which views nature as simply material for human greed and fundamentally misunderstands the place of humans in the universe. Pope Francis and Thomas Berry also reject a purely instrumental view of nature. And Pope Francis writes, the ultimate purpose of other creatures is not to be found in us. Rather, all creatures are moving forward with us and through us toward a common point of arrival, which is God in that transcendent fullness where the risen Christ embraces and illumines all things. At times, Pope Francis's language becomes poetic, echoing Francis of Assisi as well as Thomas Berry, talking about the entire universe speaking of God's love. So the traditional Buddhist warnings about craving resonate with this description of our current situation. And Buddhists agree that technological development by itself does not answer our human problem. Instead, it can promote a dangerous one-dimensional paradigm based on manipulation and control. So both 
Buddhist and Catholic traditions propose new ways of seeing the world. In the Buddhist tradition, wisdom entails seeing the interconnected nature of all realities, realizing that nothing exists in isolation. If we see this, then from this flows compassion. To teach the interconnectedness of all realities, Chinese Buddhists traditionally view the universe as the jewel net of Indra. According to calming and contemplation in the five teachings of Hua Yen, we will see that this one jewel can immediately reflect the images of all the other jewels. Each of the other jewels will do the same. Each jewel will simultaneously reflect the images of all the jewels in this manner. The images are repeated and multiplied in each other in a manner that is unbounded. At every crossing of the net, there's a sparkling jewel. And so this is one image of the universe that we are implicated in all the other realities of the universe. We reflect them and they reflect us. Buddhist scholar Stephanie Kaza comport, uh, comments on the importance of this for ecological ethics. Interdependence and interrelationship are central starting points for ecological research of food webs, nutrient cycles, and forest succession. Indra's net, however, contains more than the ecological sum of biosphere, atmosphere, and lithosphere. The Buddhist principle of interdependence includes human thought, perceptions, and values and their impacts on the ecological evolutionary conversation. This critical difference is what makes it possible and necessary for people in the net to act ethically out of regard for the other beings in the net. So this image of Indra's jewel net proposes we live in a world of radical mutual interdependence with every other being. When the Chinese empress Wu Zetian from 624 to 705, had difficulty grasping the teaching of dependent co-arising. The Buddhist teacher, Fazan, presented her with a concrete visualization. He reportedly placed an image of the Buddha next to a burning flame in the middle of a hall with mirrors on each wall, the ceiling and the floor. So the mirrors reflected the image of the Buddha countless times in every direction with each reflection being reflected in turn. And Fazang explained to the empress, in each and every reflection of any mirror, you find all the reflections of all the other mirrors, together with the specific Buddha image in each, without omission or misplacement. The principle of interpenetration and containment is clearly shown by this demonstration. Right here, we see an example of one in all and all in one. In the Buddhist tradition, wisdom and compassion are inseparable. If we see the interconnectedness of all sentient beings, we realize that their suffering affects us as well. Now, there are profound differences between Buddhist and Catholic visions of the universe and human existence, but these differences should not blind us to the points of convergence. In taking the name of St. Francis of Assisi, Pope Francis was signaling his concern for the poor and his concern for our relation with all of creation, especially with the earth. And this dual concern for the poor and for the earth runs throughout uh, the encyclical Laudato Si. And Francis also was a real model in reaching out to Muslims in his day. So he's also a model of interreligious relationships. The Confucian tradition that was so dear to Thomas Berry has long pondered how to shape a proper society based on right relationships. In doing so, it offers us resources for addressing the call for an integral ecological culture. Again, Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm have noted that Confucianism manifests a religious ecology in its cosmological orientation. Now, the epistemology generated by modern Western culture is very sophisticated, but it grew up in the context of imperialism and colonialism and continues to shape a lot of our fundamental assumptions. So that it's hard for many in the West to imagine any other view of the universe. Walter Mignolo warns, 
alternatives to modern epistemology can hardly come only from modern Western epistemology itself. This is where we need dialogue with other religions and cultures. And the Confucian scholar Du Wei Ming, whom others have already mentioned at this conference, is an example of the type of contribution we so desperately need. He proposes a contemporary interpretation of Confucian values that addresses this challenge of stopping and seeing. So Du Wei Ming calls the entire human community to move beyond the paradigm of the modern European enlightenment with its aggressive anthropocentrism that has come to dominate much of East Asia as well, he laments. Now he recognizes many accomplishments made possible by this paradigm, but he warns that the current ecological crisis calls us to critique and transform this heritage. He tells us we need to explore the spiritual resources that may help to broaden the scope of the Enlightenment project, deepen its moral sensitivity, and if necessary, transform creatively its genetic constraints in order to realize fully its potential as a worldview for the human condition as a whole. And he, Duwei Ming, like Thomas Berry, calls attention to the resources of the indigenous religious traditions around the world, commenting that a distinctive feature of primal traditions is a deep experience of rootedness. Each indigenous religious tradition is embedded in a concrete place symbolizing a way of perceiving, a mode of thinking, a form of living, an attitude, and a worldview. Given the unintended disastrous consequences of the Enlightenment mentality, there are obvious lessons that the modern mindset can learn from indigenous religious traditions. And so Du Wei Ming's call resonates again with both Thomas Berry and also Pope Francis. And like them, he believes the crisis is not simply economic, political, or social, but calls for a religious spiritual renewal. And he presents a Confucian vision of multiple belongings as a resource for this. So Dewey Ming tells us we can actually envision the Confucian perception of human flourishing based on the dignity of the human person in a series of concentric circles, self, family, community, society, nation, world, and cosmos. We embrace communal solidarity, but we have to transcend parochialism to realize its true value. And he warns us against anthropocentrism. We're inspired by human flourishing, Du Wei Ming writes, but we must endeavor not to be confined by anthropocentrism for the full meaning of humanity is anthropocosmic rather than anthropocentric. So he challenges the Western secular humanism of the Enlightenment for being anthropocentric and instead proposes, indeed it is in the anthropocosmic spirit that we find communication between self and community, harmony between human species and nature, and mutuality between humanity and heaven. This integrated comprehensive vision of learning to be human serves well as a point of departure for a new discourse on the global ethic. The Taoist tradition, what? Oh, okay, okay I'll, let me just close with a note on friendship. One of the great um, Jesuits in uh, China was Matteo Ricci, who presented his Chinese friends with a distillation of sayings on friendship. And as we know, Thomas Berry was a man of many deep friendships. And so I'd just like to close with a couple of the sayings of, um, that Matteo Ricci cited. A world without friend is a world without joy. And in a time of ecological challenge, it's especially important to be reminded a friend is the riches of the poor, the strength of the weak, and the medicine of the ill. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful broadening and for some wonderful images, the jewel net of Indra, I think. So, Nancy. Thank you, I'm so privileged to be here and thanks to each one of you. And it's after lunch, so maybe we could just take a few deep breaths.
My paper is titled, Knowing Who and Where We Are Among the White Lilies, The Vision of Thomas Berry and Pope Francis. I remember, most of all, Thomas Berry's voice and his kindness. He was a bard, a teller of tales, an evocator of wonder, a weaver of lament and woe, a grand designer of a new vision of beautiful immensity and intimacy. I use a word that is not in the dictionary, evocateur, <laughs> to convey his visionary writings and compelling power toward change. 16-year-old climate activist Greta Thunberg asks her TED Talk audience, can you hear me? Due to her diagnosis of Asperger's syndrome, she speaks only when necessary. Now she is driven by an essential question. Why does virtually no one act as though we are in the catastrophe that we are in? As an evocateur, Thomas Berry asks similarly urgent questions. As I trace the development of Berry's vision, I also hear a strong resonance with the urgent voice of Pope Francis who writes, I urgently appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet. Just as for Thunberg, the question for us about Thomas Berry and Pope Francis is, can we really hear them? I am reminded that God calls to Adam and Eve in the garden, Genesis 3, 9, where are you? Can we discover where we are and who we are through really hearing these three prophets? A good place to start is with Barry's experience of lilies, which answered his questions about who he was and where he was on a particular May morning. Quote, my own understanding of the great work began when I was quite young. At the time, I was some 11 years old. The new house was situated on a slight incline. Down below was a small creek, and there across the creek was a meadow. It was an early afternoon in late May when I first wandered down the incline, crossed the creek, and looked out over the scene. The field was covered with white lilies rising above the thick grass. A magic moment, this experience gave to my life something that seems to explain my thinking at a more profound level than almost any other experience I can remember. Whenever I think about my basic life attitude and the whole trend of my mind and the causes to which I have given my efforts, I seem to come back to this moment and the impact it has had on my feeling for what is real and worthwhile in life. What exactly is this feeling for what is real and worthwhile in life, I ask. Thomas Berry was a person of both feeling and intellect evoking the same in others, and certainly in me. This combination defines his spiritual orientation. He writes, quote, whatever preserves and enhances this meadow in the natural cycles of its transformation is good. Whatever opposes this meadow or negates it is not good. My whole life, my whole life orientation is that simple. It is also that pervasive, unquote. Thus, we learned from Barry that natural cycles of transformation deserve respect and the freedom to follow their own courses. Perceptions of the essential rights of flourishing ecosystems, such as meadows as wholes and in their innumerable parts, often conveys an awareness both of wonder and a deep sense of companionship and meaning basic to spiritual and religious orientation. Notably then, awestruck wonder doesn't require vast landscapes for its evocation. As many meditation teachers suggest, Barry's Meadow shows that small scenes can inspire deeply meaningful experiences. This in part has to do with the capacities of the viewer. Quote, the more meaning a person finds in the main time blooming of the lilies, the more awestruck a person might be in simply looking out over this little patch of meadowland, unquote. Thus, apparently, seeing deeply and well into the small enlarges vision's capacity. For Barry, a person who finds such meaning and awe in this little meadow 
has perhaps unknowingly entered into an experience at the heart of religion. Barry writes, religion takes its origin here in the deep mystery of this setting, unquote. Not only awareness of mystery, but of the magnificence of life as celebration are evoked by receptivity to the lilies in the meadow. Entrance then into an experience of the mysterious, which elicits, if only for in a moment, an awareness of life itself as celebratory, nourished in Barry a commitment to protect what has now been rightly seen as of ultimate value. Wonder, a profound sense of meaning in life of celebration then marked Barry's feeling and intellectual vision. This quality of awareness remained critically important as he evolved from a historian of religions to a cultural historian, from a theologian to a geologian. Barry well knew that such experiences of wonder and awe echoed religious expressions through centuries, expressed in the Western tradition through biblical scripture. Psalm 8, 3, 4, from a wide-angled vision. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars that you have established, what are human beings that you are mindful of them, mortals that you care for them? Jesus, focusing on the close-up, responded to the lily's beauty with a profound awareness about God's benevolent care and foresight to clothe them in such beauty leading him to postulate that God constantly has in mind and heart the necessity to meet the physical needs of human beings, Matthew 6, 28 to 30. These feelings of awestruck wonder were evoked in Thomas Berry not only by landscapes such as the meadow with lilies or later by the Hudson River, but also by scientific discoveries about the evolving universe. Small back to large, quote, my suggestion is that just as Christianity in its developing phase established itself in intimate relations with the structure and functioning of the universe in its liturgical processes, so now there is a need to adapt a new sense of a self-emergent universe as a sacred mode whereby the divine becomes present to the human community." Unquote. Thus, whether captured by a dragonfly's beauty as she hovers over a shimmering summer pond, or by the immensity of the Milky Way viewed on a winter's night, or perhaps by grief at the felling of a beloved grove of trees, as Gerard Manley Hopkins memorialized in Binsey Poplar's Feld, 1879, the divine comes close to a person with an open eye, mind, and heart. What then might harm the feeling of being awestruck at the meadow? It is what harms the meadow itself. Barry and we know that beloved meadows, wetlands, groves, streams, ponds, rivers, and the oceans are degraded or lost as they are cut down, paved over, drained, and despoiled. People who love their landscapes and have a sense of awe and identification with them often come to grieve their loss love and pain inextricably linked. Many people no longer have an intimate presence with natural surroundings and can no longer read the book of nature, as Barry said. Though children inherit a natural attraction to nature, adults are so misguided that, quote, we must make our children unfeeling in their relation with the natural world. To indoctrinate them, into a contrived predatory economic system and an increasingly toxic environment. Though we are creating the sixth great extinction, few are aware. Thomas Berry has been said earlier last night, quote, interpreted this massive assault on earth processes as manifesting the colonial age and its sense of humans as a master species subject, subjecting all other species to its, racular, to its rational calculations, all of which is rooted in a, quote, deep inner rage of Western society against its earthly condition. To impress a feeling of wonder and celebration, broad societal structures must be reoriented to a beneficial relation to Earth. 
Barry addresses the need for universities, corporations, and other systems to reorient goals and activities to include preservation of the natural life systems. The consumer economic system sees nature as providing natural resources to create consumer goods which, quote, are passed on to the junk heap where the remains are useless at best and it works toxic to every living thing. <coughs> the great work is nothing less than conversion. In Barry's famous evocative phrase, quote, the historical mission of our times is to reinvent the human at the species level with critical reflection within the community of life systems in a time developmental context by means of story and shared dream experience. For those with a capacity for suffering from awareness of human earth alienation, it is helpful to know that lamentation is essential to change. Grief may lead to new awareness, repentance, and a vision that fosters life. Further, establishing a flourishing and sustainable human mode of being within Earth's evolving diverse bioregions is the one thing necessary, requiring identifying with, quote, the sacred depth of the individual bonded into an evolving universe. Barry suggests, and I find this breathtakingly hopeful, that Earth herself will provide impetus for humanity to grow to true maturity and a beneficial human-Earth relation. The great work thus blends scientific consciousness, wonder, and compassion, integrating a deep knowing of, as has been repeated before, the universe as composed of subjects to be communed with, not as objects to be exploited. It is this new self-realization which is a reinvention of ourselves as participating in our genetic relatedness to Earth, as well as in the material elements of the universe. Now, Earth, as the primary energy, becomes our dream. The dream of the Earth will give us guidance. As nighttime dreams often provide structure and meaning, so too the dream of the Earth is our way into the future and as I reread Thomas Berry after having known him for beginning at least 30 years ago, this question of the dream became more and more a search for me. Dreaming with Earth's processes and structures allows them to instruct and transform us, eliciting in us a mature vision akin to shamanic consciousness. Mary Evelyn Tucker and John Grimm in their biography note that Berry, quote, saw himself as a shamanic type, one who entered deeply into the powers of the universe and earth and brought back an integrative vision for the community. They continue, this, he sensed that this role was part of his psyche and thus vital for his spiritual journey, unquote. And Barry asserted that this leadership involves everyone in responsibility and awareness. We, therefore, and hopefully with many others, will grow to be shamanic leaders who have integrated, as Barry calls for, four wisdoms of indigenous peoples, of wi women, of the traditions, and of science. Christian shamanic leaders may helpfully integrate their vision, as I have done and so many others in this room, with that of Théard de Chardin, as does Pope Francis. Tucker and Grimm note that there existed a hope in, quote, the human as part of the whole of cosmic emergence that gave Teilhard and Thomas a common sense of vision and purpose, unquote. Helpful to us as would-be shamans, such hope proffers for us a zest for life, infusing energy for the great work ahead. In the context of these efforts to bring energy and urgency to the great work, many groups and individuals around the world celebrated the publication of Pope Francis Laudato Si on care for our common home. It was admired by UN leaders, scientists, and the journal Nature, among many other groups. In my experience, the Catholic bishop in Vermont sent it to all the churches. Our Lutheran Bishop of New England wrote a joint statement with the Roman Catholic Bishop of Boston commending its reading in congregational groups. 
I heard it beautifully read in a worship service at Riverside Church simultaneously as Pope Francis addressed the United Nations. It is critically important as a moral statement for our time. The encyclical is, quote, an appeal for a new dialogue about how we are shaping the future of our planet, which includes everyone. The Franciscan sensibilities of simplicity and concern that all parts of creation are experienced as kin under God's care infuses Laudato Si. Pope Francis writes that we have not shown ourselves worthy of gracious abundance and care extended to us by earth, who is both mother and sister. Quote, this sister now cries out to us because of the harm we have inflicted on her by our irresponsible use and abuse of the goods with which God has endowed her, unquote. In concert with Thomas Berry, Pope Francis writes that an urgent change is needed on all societal levels to reclaim our family life. Creation speaks of God and thus has inherent dignity and value. All creation not only shows, quote, forth the inexhaustible riches of God, unquote, but the creation itself is a locus of God's presence. All creatures are linked by unseen bonds and together form a kind of universal family, a sublime communion, which fills us with a sacred, affectionate, and humble respect, unquote. The misuse and abuse of Mother Earth stems from violence and power over vulnerable people and nature. The encyclical especially emphasizes abusive power relationships. Many humans fail to see or to feel the sacred dimension of humanity or of the more than human creation. Quote, if we approach nature and the environment without an openness to awe and wonder, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs, unquote. For Pope Francis, a people united under God, will be truly united with the more than human world in an intimate familial sense. In common with Barry, who spoke of a devastating technological trance, Pope Francis laments, laments the globalization of the technocratic paradigm. This paradigm has altered relationships among human beings and material objects from one of friendship to confrontation, such reductionism dictated by interests of certain powerful groups. Technological, scientific, and economic power, the Pope writes, are often not used wisely for the common good, and therefore power over others excludes awareness of the dignity and value of all creatures as beloved by God. He writes that expectation for the market to solve environmental problems reveals the market's narrowness in not considering, quote, balanced levels of production, a better distribution of wealth, concern for the environment, and the rights of future generations. An integrated approach that addresses both the environmental and social crises is needed. Pope Francis writes, quote, we cannot presume to heal our relationship with nature and the environment without healing all fundamental human relationships, unquote. With an echo of Barry's call for reinvention of the human at the species level, Pope Francis decries a schizophrenic anthropocentrism, which not only sees no intrinsic value in created things, but disregards, quote, the message contained in the structures of nature itself, unquote. The encyclical calls out the effects of climate change and species extinction as the most serious environmental issues that compound others, <coughs> such as access to clean water. Poverty, injustice, and abuses of creation intertwine. Quote, we have to realize that a true ecological approach always becomes a social approach it must integrate questions of justice in debates on the environment so as to hear both the cry of the earth and the cry of the poor, unquote, which has been mentioned earlier. The Pope echoes many liberation theologians. A person who feels the sacred family-like connection with all creation will feel the pain of environmental abuse almost, quote, as a physical ailment, unquote. Such pain 
with the virtues of simplicity, faith in God, appreciation of beauty, and compassion will bring us to know Earth as home and truly know and be ourselves. Science and all realms of human endeavor will become aligned with justice and care for Earth's ecosystems. Special awareness and care for the most vulnerable within the human family and creation admits humans into, quote, their vocation to be protectors of God's handiwork, essential to a life of virtue, unquote. They have discovered then who and where they are and can answer vo God's voice in the garden, where are you? Very and Pope Francis, to conclude, relocate the promotion of human progress and Earth's flourishing within a theological, salvific framework, strongly away from otherworldly to this worldly, this planetary, this universe concerns. Their writings continue to contribute to healing the tragic science-religion rift promoted by some Christian groups and foster humanity's conversion on all levels to Earth care by linking deep spiritual integrity to Earth's well-being. For Pope Francis, the final centering point is God. Quote, each organism as a creature of God is good and admirable in itself, unquote. For Barry, the emphasis may be more strongly on Earth. Quote, the natural world is the fundamental locus for the meeting of the divine and the human, unquote. Yet the distinction and emphasis may be very small, and both see as illuminative the cosmic Christ portrayed in the New Testament, through whom all things are made and all things hold together. Both urge a deep transformation. Human identity must change for Barry into shamanic consciousness and for Pope Francis into a prophetic contemplative awareness of kinship with all creatures. All such conversions for Barry and Pope Francis followed by action. Both link the well-being of humanity with the well-being of Earth expressed as an integral ecology. Barry, quote, intimacy with the planet in its wonder and beauty and the full depth of its meaning is what enables an integral human relationship with the planet to function, unquote. Pope Francis, quote, strategies for a solution demand an integrated approach to combating poverty, restoring dignity to the excluded, and at the same time protecting nature. Unquote. With Thomas Berry and Pope Francis as our prophetic guides, not only for life orientation and meaning, but for action, we find ourselves able more readily to answer the 16-year-old prophet's question, can you hear me? And God's question, where are you? With the answers, yes, and we are home. Thank you. Well, thank you for a very prophetic uh, set of insights. Uh, Heather. Maybe we should all take another deep breath. I know it's a lot of talking. Um, I'm also very grateful for being here. I'm grateful to John Borelli and to Mary Evelyn and John and for all the conversations that we're having, the contributions, uh, and to uh, Georgetown University for hosting this event. So thank you for that. I'm going to begin with a confession, which I think is appropriate in a Catholic context. <laughs> I'm a Barryite. Now, I think we should have a BA, Barryites Anonymous. <laughs> and I think it's not such a big confession here, but uh, I was introduced to Thomas Barry by Steve Dunn in 1985. <clears throat> and he then directed my doctoral research in feminism and Tom Berry's cosmological proposal. And as Brian was saying, when one spends time listening to Berry, reading his works, pondering extensively, there is no turning back. The mind bends, the horizons expand, spirituality deepens, understanding and gratitude flow. Everything is more important, intense and magnificent and painful than it was before. And as I'm sure all of you know, it's a life's work to absorb and integrate and live out of what Tom has proposed. This sacred living cosmos, as eloquently has been described here. So my contribution has three parts. 
first a few comments on Thomas Berry's uh, cosmology, then some on Laudato Si, and then I return to Thomas Berry. So Thomas Berry, his dream, I'm just going to focus right now on what he meant by functional cosmology. And as many of you have said, and those of you who know him, he had an enormous desire for intelligibility and coherence. And he felt that intelligibility and coherence has layers of continuity throughout all of the phenomenological order, or else nothing makes sense. So for Tom, functional cosmology was already a composite, but it starts with the emergent universe. This highly differentiated, emergent, dynamic, immense, and intimate reality. Because I'm very close to the last speaker, I'm deleting things that many of you have already said. So I'm not going to give you a description of cosmogenesis as I have here because Barry did it. But this shift from cosmos to cosmogenesis is the shift that we're grappling with. And also that as the universe develops, it becomes more meaning, more complex, more interactive, more entwined, more vibrant and more intense. And this is why for Pierre Théard de Chardin and for Barry, the best image is cosmos to cosmogenesis. And this implies this continuity between cosmogenesis, geogenesis and biogenesis. And Barry, as Teilhard de Chardin, these discoveries of both cosmology and evolution are the, at the order of a revelatory experience. And furthermore, if you, if you extrapolate whatever capacities developed within the human as a species must first be a capacity of the universe and the earth. So spirituality and religious consciousness are foremost a dimension of the universe developed within Earth's evolutionary processes. And this is a far more radical awareness than many have yet to appreciate. So this intelligibility, coherence and continuity, Barry realized that what we know of the universe and Earth's evolutionary processes is radically new knowledge the reference points for understanding not just the universe and the earth, but ourselves, our role in the scheme of things, who we are and how we are to live, it all changes. It's new knowledge. So for Tom, as you know, to understand anything, we have to understand that the universe is the primary reference and the primary sacred community. So that's an overview in a nutshell of my understanding of, anyway, I'll leave it there. <laughs> I'm going to shift to Laudato Si. This is an important and welcome statement. It's in the tradition of Catholic social teaching. It's a very significant encyclical. It has been very well received. For many, it's quite surprising because it's, it has a style that is open and accessible. It has content that is relatively straightforward, easily to understand. The sources of the document are somewhat unusual in the sense that it's papal sources and church publications, but mainly from Mexico, Brazil, the Philippines, Japan, and even Canada. It's not proof text in the usual biblical proof texting style. It quotes from the Earth Charter, <clears throat> the Real Declaration from Dante, Science is an equal partner with social sciences, and it's a call to unity and to dialogue and to solidarity. There are, there are several themes that I want to mention that I think are significant for our conversations, and one is this term, integral ecology. And this is a fresh analysis because it addresses the whole earth, <clears throat> the need for the best science, that integral ecology means the biosphere is integrated, it's integral, and that ecological interconnectedness and interdependence is also another meaning of integral ecology. The document starts by talking about the whole earth, water, biodiversity, pollution, 
talks about ecological literacy, planetary understandings, ecosystems. The document shifts back and forth between the natural world having intrinsic rights and being anthropocentric. Uh, it's, uh, it shifts back and forth, but it does speak first about the natural world and what is happening. The second part of the document that I think is very important and also related to integral ecology, it's speaking to the whole world. That the human roots of the ecological crisis are global and it has to do with consumerism and waste and lack of respect for the natural world. It talks about the language of our common home, which is the language of the common good, of universality, universal solidarity. And this is, in my view, rather than Christian imperialism, this openness is new, radical, and very important. It's open to religious pluralism. Another part of the document is critiquing values, the values of ignorance, apathy, individualism, weak ethics. There's a strong theme throughout the document about criticizing political apathy, cultures of affluence, greed and indifference, corruption, poor leadership. The main theme of the document is, of course, this call to justice, the call to equality that links the frailty of the natural world with poverty and inequality, to see the connections between ecological and social decline, and that these are connected to injustices. Of course, it's a, it, as a liberation theologian, it has a structural analysis, an economic analysis about how poverty is created and sustained, what are the bases of inequalities and of injustice, and of course, the use of power. The document talks a lot about the mechanisms that generate poverty and exclusion. And it doesn't come at this to say we need compassion for. It's really a confrontation with inequality and unlivable life conditions and options for people who have to live without dignity. The causes of ecological decline, economics, values, apathy, corruption. But the appeal is that whatever ecological issues we're talking about, are global and planetary, and planetary. Even if the causes are entrenched in global economic structures, in governance systems, every culture is implicated. Respecting, of course, cultural distinctiveness, it's still a call, it's a call to everyone. I think the spirituality of the document, which is uh, subtle, is rich, deep, it's about the common good, it is more challenging than comforting, and it's a shift from personalist ethics to social ethics. The key theme, as mentioned, cry of the poor, cry of the earth by Boff, or preferential option for the poor, preferential option for the earth. It does detail the gross injustices of maldistribution of benefits and burdens, and this intersecting injustices. And of course, that the sufferings of people are intimately linked to the sufferings of the natural world and their liberations are tied together. The document also talks a lot about the need for institutional transformation, justice, effectiveness, the challenge to governments, to the UN, to the war making industries, to trafficking, drugs, cultures, the loss of liberty, the moral decline, the escalation of violence, all of this. But one is left with this notion of integral ecology. It's insightful and it's useful that there's an integral earth community, that ecological, social, political, and ethical systems are integrated. They will be transformed together. So Laudato Si is a welcome contribution. It's worth our time and our attention and our promotion. I think it's very good not to have another repressive pope obsessed with women's sexuality. <laughs> I think it's good to have encyclical that's not promoting Christian supremacy. I think it's very good uh, to have an encyclical that's attempting to grapple with the contemporary current world. And it is a very powerful ethical appeal, a moral imperative. Chris Hedges, whom I really like, says, Pope Francis has moved the church back into the realm of reality. 
Michael Lerner, Rab Rabbi Michael Lerner says, the Pope's encyclical on the environment is one of the most articulate and accessible presentations of the need to radically transform the global economic and political order. It's a very important document. And I would say hesitantly, but that the Synod on the Amazon and its emphasis on ecological sin, also on social inequality, justice, and north-south alliances. Solidarity is very significant. It's still unfortunate they missed out half the human race with women, but on the other things, I think they did quite well on that synod. Sorry, I can't help it. <laughs> so I think Laudato Si is a very significant contribution. But I want to I want to return to Thomas Berry and what he does more than Laudato Si. And I say this not as a comparison or a critique, but Barry's vision and dream is broad and deep. And as you have been hearing for two days, it's full of knowledge about cultures and language, religions, rituals, symbolic consciousness. It's informed by earth science, economics, cultural historian, scholar of religions. Uh, but all of that gave him an understanding of uh, what I'm calling religious consciousness. Now for Barry, the universe is the fundamental revelatory experience. It's a community of subjects. The earth is primary and the human is derivative. These are pithy phrases from Tom, but they do take some pondering to grasp in their depth. So the breadth of his comprehension, Tom Berry, the extent of his knowledge is, is quite staggering. But what I think is more important, well, I shouldn't say that, very important, is that this intellectual acumen transformed his awareness, his perception, his acuity. He was deeply transformed by what he was learning. And this search for intelligibility and coherence got distilled in the dream of the earth, evening thoughts, the sacred universe. But while his prose is lyric, his proposal is not for the faint-minded. It's a masterful rendering of this, all of this knowledge, including the inner sensibilities, interiority, as well as cultural histories. But throughout is this awareness of how psychic energies are galvanized by dreams and stories, myths and symbols, metaphors, and especially that of journey and story. So for Barry, religions are shaping awareness and psychic orientations. One of my favorite books of his is actually Five Oriental Philosophies, which is, it, it speaks of what kind of psychic orientation is cultivated and fostered and oriented through religions and through particular experiences. This is religious consciousness. In Dream of the Earth, he writes, any effective response to the current issues requires a religious context. We cannot do without their traditional religions, but they cannot presently do what needs to be done. We need a new kind of religious orientation. Christianity and the Fate of the Earth, which is a very powerful set of essays, he writes, the problem is not Christianity per se, but that the Christian promise and process permeates the psychic orientation and cultural expectations or worldview. The sense of living in a radically unsatisfactory world remains a central fact of our consciousness, some idea that we deserve a better world. He spoke of this regularly. This is one of his other phrases, religion as we know it is over. Religions in their current form cannot respond to the magnitude of the crisis. We cannot respond without them. Religions will neither be eradicated nor replaced. They will be transformed in creative and vital ways. He called repeatedly for a new type of religious orientation. No, he didn't call for it. I think he proposed it. And he says, this must emerge out of our new story of the universe. This is a new revelatory experience. And it can be understood as soon as we recognize that the evolutionary process is from the beginning a spiritual as well as physical process. That the universe from the beginning 
is material, physical, psychic, and spiritual. This is, of course, Teilhard de Chardin. But this is, in fact, a new insight, a new context, and a new horizon of interpretation, at least for the West. Traditional religions developed with no awareness of what we know of the universe, cosmos as cosmogenesis, dark matter, over 100 billion galaxies, earth processes and evolution, the radical interrelatedness of the biosphere, emergent complexity, or any of these insights. So what Tom says is we need a cosmology of religions. <coughs> Excuse me. This new type of religious consciousness of interiority and psychic orientation, this must inform our way forward. We say that the universe is the primary sacred community. It's the primary revelation of the divine, the primary scripture, the primary locus of divine human communication. Religions are, of course, not the source of spiritual depth. It's the earth processes. It's the cosmological processes. Here's a quote from Tom Berry. Our spirituality is earth-derived. If there is no spirituality in the earth, there is no spirituality in ourselves. The human and the earth are totally implicated in each other. Our spiritual sensibilities are derived from and dependent upon a flourishing earth. It's the lushness, the diversity, the elegance, and the challenges of earth life that create the conditions for the potent sensibilities we call spiritual. As the earth diminishes, so will our spiritual capacities. Barry writes, so integral is our inner world with the outer world that if the outer world is damaged, then the inner world of our souls is diminished proportionately. When we so ruthlessly extinguish the life forms of our period, we threaten, along with those planetary beings, the inner life of the human. So the physical degradation of the natural world is also the degra degradation of the interior world of humans. I would say that um, what he's proposing is a depth and breadth of religious experiences that will shape a psychic orientation. It's not a replacement of religions. It's situating religions in a much larger cosmological process. Now, Barry's intellectual acumen far surpasses most mere mortals. I think that's fair to say, listening what... <coughs> what we have heard. I did want to address this concern about justice or lack of concern of justice in Barry's preoccupations. So I've been a Barryite for quite some time, and this, this topic comes up regularly, that it's lovely to contemplate the universe, but what about the Earth, social injustices, these processes? And I could say that Tom had a deep, compelling and dry, excuse me, <coughs> His concern for in, uh, the injustices, the unbearable life conditions, the loss of dignity, this drove him, this preoccupied his soul. The suffering of the earth community, humans included, was his main preoccupation. <clears throat> his main preoccupation was not pondering the night sky. His main preoccupation was what is a way forward for a viable future. But what he knew was that for this to happen, we need a profound cultural shift. Laudato Si recognizes the same. <clears throat> Barry knew we cannot ignore the layers of human systems of domination, that the world is organized ideologically, socially, and material with, within various matrices of domination. But he also knew, which I think is hard for us to recognize, especially academics, is that customary intellectual tools that measure, define, analyze, critique, deconstruct, these have limits. These intellectual processes, while valuable, neither come from nor speak to the depths of human interiority. 
So they cannot illuminate what is learned of the comprehensiveness and coherence of the universe. I believe that Barry would have stood, stood beside Greta Thunberg and supported Extinction Rebellion and 350.org. <laughs> Although he was not an activist, he was asked one time at Port Burwell, you know, what should we do? And this is what his answer was. Take all the cars off the road and blow up the bridges. <laughs> and he was, someone said, that's very violent. And he said, well, you know, I'm not opposed to that, that particular form. So there's many roles we have in the great, in the great work. And I think it's, it's hair splitting to divide <clears throat> social justice and cosmology. They're integral, they're interrelated. Tom's contribution is not as an activist. What is very unique about what he offers is the depth of his understanding is what the source of the depth of his response. And this is why he shifts to celebration more so than analysis. And I quote, it's in every aspect of the, sorry, in every aspect the human is a participatory reality. We are members of a great universe community. We participate in its life. We are nourished by this community. We are instructed by this community and we are healed by this community. The universe is a relationship of intimacy and this is an intimacy with a numinous reality. The universe is becoming intelligible in human intelligence and Barry takes us on a journey, an exterior journey to the edges of time and space, to the farthest reaches of the cosmos, to cosmogenesis. It's a breathtaking journey. But this journey then becomes an inner intimate journey. We are the universe reflecting back on itself. We are members of an earth community. Again from Tom, I quote, the universe carries the deep mysteries of our existence within itself. We cannot discover ourselves without first discovering the universe, the earth and the imperatives of our own being. We have no existence uh, outside of the earth and outside of the universe. So the exterior quest to understand the universe is intimately connected to the inner quest to know what it means to be human and to discern how to live. To understand and integrate that we are a self-conscious element of the, Earth's, of the Earth's crust and of the living cosmos is a great challenge. It's truly a deep awakening. It's an exterior and interior quest. Our horizons enlarge, our awareness heightens, and our religious sensibilities intensify. To live in a sacred, vibrant cosmos is to experience these intimate immensities, to use the term of Gaston Bachelard. And these illuminate a path, a radical openness to the future. It awakens in us and awakens us to the depths of our being. The cosmos is not just out there, it's also within. And this is the gift of Thomas Berry of profound importance this spiritual awakening. Thank you. We've had, I think, a wonderful set of journeys uh, through dreams and mirrors and moral imperatives, etc. So, But the question now is how much time you're giving us, John. Take a good 10 minutes. Okay, so 10 minutes. <laughs> So who would like to uh, ask, a, ask a question? Okay, I see a hand over there. Okay, well, let's start. I'm going to get rid of cars. I'm going to brag. I don't own a car right now. I'm sorry. I had a car for the purposes of getting my children, my trio, getting my children to, oh, I'm sorry. Really, this is going to be recorded? Oh, my God. All right, so my name is Miss Smith. Uh, I had a car for the good of my children who, when they got a chance to go to school, 
needed it, needed me to drive them. I'm sorry that public transportation hasn't come up uh, to the level that we all would like. But since my children are in their 50s and 40s and moved away, and I'm a widow, I don't need a car. I have a bus that I proudly get, or Uber, sorry to say that if I'm in a hurry, like I had to come here from work. How do you get everybody to get rid of a car? Because I'm all for it. Put me at the front of, 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 of the spokespeople for it's easy. I haven't had a car since 2005, and I gave up my driver's license. So tell me, how can I help to, because to, I think that's the first thing we can do. That's a doable thing. Thank you. Beautiful program. Okay, would someone like to take that? <laughs> <laughs> we need public transportation. I mean, there's no quick, quick answer. You're, you're not really expecting an answer. I mean, good for you that you don't have a car. I think that's fabulous. Many parts of the world, transportation is necessary. Public transportation is, is really extremely important. We should all be demanding using our democratic rights to get public transportation. Okay, I'm going Among to- other things. I'm going to suggest that we take a few questions because we have very little time. It's coming to the end, and I see several hands. So I saw a hand in the middle over there, um, here, number two and number three. So someone, well, we'll start there. I, someone was yes. Uh, so Heather, um, you hedged on the feminist issue. I know that's very important to you, and. I wonder if you might speak about patriarchy and Thomas Berry. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Let's let's go here. That's Herman Green. You were asked to identify yourself, please. Herman Green. Okay. Good. You had a question right here. Oh, I said let's take a few um, because we have so little time. I know it's not the best way, but it, I think it'll help, so. Mine is not a question. Okay, well, why don't you do whatever you're going to do? Say, use, go, go, grandparent. Yeah. <laughs> Look it up, go, go, grandparent. <laughs> okay, is there another urgent, yes. Um, Hi, I'm Greg Drury, and uh, I'll go with the title contemplative for this question. And that is um, our perspective. Uh, I hear this is a good system. This is a good way to change our rules. It's a good uh, distinction to make in the world. But if you take a common Christian phrase, which would be um, man has dominion over all in the earth, uh, that dominion could be interpreted by a person of higher consciousness as saying that's stewardship. As, as that form of dominion over these species. It's my responsibility to care for the earth or care. So that's my question is, please comment on that because I heard that thread in all of your talks. Okay. Um, why don't we, we go to, so why don't you take the, uh, the feminist uh, question as a start and then I'm not sure what to do with Go Go Grandmother and you can. It's an organization. People should <laughs> yes, look it up. I know, but what we should say about it. Uh -huh. So patriarchy and Thomas Berry and feminism is an uneasy alliance, of course. Uh, I do think that, um, I mean, it, Tom wrote a, a book about, uh, sorry, he wrote about patriarchy and its problems. I think he had a, I mean, this is a man of his, of his context, right? This is a man of his era. He certainly recognized the contribution of women, but I would not say he had a profound patriarchal analysis or a particularly strong feminist consciousness Nonetheless, I would say he shifted in that direction over his life, and he, I mean, to, to understand a feminist analysis takes also a bit of work, you know, it's not simply just including women and saying it's, uh, it's equality, it's understanding how these systems of domination work. And, in, I mean, I did write a dissertation on feminism and Thomas Berry, so I do get the dilemma, but in defense of Tom, I would say that wasn't his question. In the same way, the moral questions, it's not that they weren't his preoccupation, but he didn't see the answer coming from critical analysis. He saw the answers coming from dream, vision, story, journey. 
something that had deeper roots in the psychic orientation of cultures. So um, I would say the feminist questions weren't his questions, but not because he had a disregard. It's simply just not the way he did his composite. But I would hazard a guess that had he lived longer, given you everything you've heard he's read, he would have read more. He did quite appreciate Charlene Spretnik, and he loved the masculine feminine, which of course is not a particularly feminist analysis. He never quite got that right, but we forgave, well, sort of forgave him that one. <laughs> Feminists don't forgive, you see, so. <laughs> but they don't forget. Either. They definitely don't forget. <laughs> So I can Do you want the to dominion question? Yes, you're exactly right. The dominion in, in scripture means for humans to be have dominion as God has dominion, which is as creator and sustainer. So to follow that means that humans would be stewards in a very, very broad sense of, of fostering the life of creation. Thank you. Do you have a Christians have often read the first chapter of Genesis as leading up to the creation of humans, because we kind of like that. Jewish tradition has often read it as leading up to the Sabbath rest, because that's where the telos is. And whatever dominion means in the first chapter of Genesis, the first humans are to be vegetarians. They're not allowed to eat other animals. And so I think we need to look at it, especially today in light of Tom Berry's work in terms of our responsibility, that we have a level of dominion now that Tom Berry pointed out. We decide which species will live and which will die. And we have a tremendous destructive power. And so I think myself, we need to read the first chapter of Genesis in conjunction with chapters 38 to 42 of the book of Job, where God points out all these creatures that humans don't even see, the mountain goats way up high in remote mountain areas and the big creatures in the sea. And it's not all about you. It's a very non-anthropocentric vision of creation. So I think we have to read the whole variety of scriptural images of creation in relation to each other. And for me, whatever we make of this dominion, it means responsibility. Uh, shall we take one more or? Okay, one more, I see one hand. So I think in Laudato Si, it's paragraph 66 or 67, it says dominion has the, the, a, new, a new hermeneutic in ter terms of care, protect, and preserve. Okay, okay, I guess that's it then. Uh, it's, uh, leaves, it's left to us simply to thank everyone very much and look forward to the next chapter.